and this morning I am introducing our speaker, Professor Michael Minch. Professor Michael Minch joined the Department of Philosophy and Humanities at Utah Valley University in 2001. His accomplishments over his 20-year tenure at UVU left an indelible mark on his department, the university, the community, and on conflict-impacted communities around the world. He was involved in organizing no fewer than 54 conferences and symposia at UVU alone during that time period. Michael founded Utah Valley University's Peace and Justice Studies program in 2003 and directed that program for over a decade. He created study abroad programs in Northern Ireland, Haiti, Cuba, the Middle East, and Russia. His extensive work in democratization, education, sustainable development, and conflict transformation have taken him to all of these locations and more recently to Brazil and to Guinea Bissau, where his work in these areas has been both tireless and fruitful. His efforts in peace building have been recognized by honors and awards, including the Utah Gandhi Peace Alliance's Gandhi Peace Award. Michael's dozens of publications and professional papers have established him as an internationally recognized figure in particular in the areas of conflict resolution and peace building. Recently, he founded and is co-editor of the book series, Peace Studies, Edges and Innovations, published by Cambridge Scholars Press. His latest book, Democratic Virtues, Peace and a Livable Future, is currently in preparation for publication. Please join me in welcoming Michael Minch back to Utah Valley University and in congratulating him on his retirement from UVU this past December. It is wonderful to be here. It is great to be back. Well, thank you so much, Pierre. I greatly appreciate uh, Pierre and the Philosophy and Humanities Department and uh, Brian Birch and the Center for the Study of Ethics and uh, their uh, amazing support they gave me during all that time and uh, continue to give me. So it's delightful, thank you. Okay, so we'll jump right in. <laughs> Ernest Bloch wrote that the most tragic form of loss isn't the loss of security, it's the loss of the capacity to imagine that things could be different. Today I want to speak to why things need to be different and how to make them so. I will not dwell on what's wrong, saying comparatively less about that than I will about how we can build our way in the right direction. In the bad news, good news dialectic, I will try to challenge us with the call to good news more than lament the bad. What can we imagine as feasible dynamics and force fields, ecologies and structures of democracy so badly needed as we live in a deep sink in our national character and geography? A sink so deep and wide that it can technically and non-hyperbolically be called in respect to its political form, neo-fascism. James Baldwin said that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Can we build an educational system that inculcates democratic virtue and commitment and thus defeats injustice and anti-democratic forces? I think the answer to this critical, qu critical question is yes, but the challenge is profound and it calls for courage. It calls for what Nietzsche called a long obedience in the same direction an obedience necessary, he wrote, to make life worth living. As I noted, I do not think it necessary to belabor the depth of our anti-democratic moment, a sink in our historical geography that is an extraordinarily, <coughs> extraordinarily dangerous crisis. We need, however, to be deeply alarmed, all our warning bells ringing and our sirens blaring, Democracy was already on life support long before Donald Trump was elected. And I will resist the temptation to argue for a genealogy of this deplorable situation, but I will remind you of facts that speak volumes. For example, the George W. Bush administrations were so afraid of democracy 
that during his second election campaign, people wearing John Kerry t-shirts were not allowed in his Bush campaign rallies, which of course is nothing compared to be uh, to be to being lying lied in uh, into war. Trump was not the first to make mendacity a key structural feature of his presidency. Recall that Iraq had nothing to do with 9/11. You might also recall that the very day of President Obama's first inauguration. Mitch McConnell gathered the Republican congressional leadership and they agreed on their agenda for his presidency. The refusal to allow him to win one single vote, even on small mundane matters or those with broad bipartisan support. At this historical moment, in a context such as ours, the challenge is how to briefly summarize our crisis. It is so deep and constituted by so many components that one worries any summary will miss too much that is important to omit, too important to omit. Nevertheless, here is an offer at such a summary. Theodore Odono wrote that fascism was something that came to life in the course of a powerful social development and that language provides it with a refuge. Within this refuge, he continued, a smoldering evil expresses itself as though it were salvation. At the heart of the neo-fascism or anti-democratic complex we now face is fear, resentment, grievance, and anger. A narrative that white Christian persons and men in particular have had the country ripped away from them. And so salvation is needed. The ide ideology and mythology of loss, deceit, and betrayal which fuels the right grievance machine has been ginned up, constructed by conservative elites who make a lot of money through the industrial scale anger, hypocrisy, and falsehood. It is not, of course, as though white blue collar workers have not been set back with nearly the entirety of the working class. And it is not that conservatives have not lost some of the cultural battles waged over the past decade. But the absurd irony is that our political culture and our politics has shifted radically to the right since at least 1980. And while conservatives have gained unprecedented power across culture and political institutions, they have complained vociferously and often disingenuously that they are victims. A narrative of victimhood lies at the foundation of anti-democratic movements. Thus, the proclaimed need for salvation. Salvation always comes for the enemies of democracy by appeals to democracy, which are ruses to cover over the diminishment or destruction of democracy. Salvation is seen to come by way of strong men, whether a Mussolini, a Hitler, a Suharto, a Duterte, a Bolsonaro, an Erdogan, a Modi, an Urban, an Afriki, a Putin, or a Trump, or now a strong woman, perhaps, in Italy's just elected Maloney. Elements of the present neo-fascism in the United States include, of course, the widespread efforts to undermine free and fair elections, but also to radically transform the systems of voting and counting votes at the state level through Republican legislatures and attorneys general, so that office holders are produced by Republican machinery rather than citizens' votes. This, on top of gerrymandering, which is simply a way for politicians to choose voters rather than voters to choose politicians. All of this fueled by an obscene amount of money dumped into the political system whereby those with wealth get to call the tune to which legislators dance. Note that three weeks ago, $1.6 billion were injected into extremist Republican organizations and that that money will soon find its way into the campaigns for which it was intended. Note also that just a few days ago, zero Senate Republicans voted to curb dark money when they voted against the Disclose Act. Robert Pape and his research team at the University of Chicago's Project on Security Threats 
tell us that now there are 13 million Americans, 5% of our population, who say they would support the use of violence to restate Trump to the White House. So electoral integrity aside, the monies aside, we have to think about violence. We think about the violence against communities of color who live in a police state in the United States. Police assault against black citizens in particular is shocking, both in terms of violence in the streets and on the property of black citizens, but also in terms of incarceration, which given the 13th Amendment to the Constitution is essentially slavery. The attacks on electoral integrity, the conflation of patriotism with war waged against history and critical thinking, the celebration of anti-intellectualism, the comfort with public display of white supremacy, the embrace and promotion of violence by Republican leaders, these and other variables constitute an anti-democratic politics that political scientists now no longer register as a democracy. The storming of the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th to stop a democratic transfer of power was not an isolated incident. As Senator Lindsey Graham noted a few days ago, if Donald Trump is indicted for crimes and finds himself in court, and all the more if he is found guilty, we should expect violence in the streets. According to Freedom Report, issued by Freedom House, the United States has experienced an 11-point decline in freedom since just 2020, making it one of the 25 countries in the world to suffer the steepest decline in democratic metrics. The U.S. now ranks closer to countries such as Romania and Pan Panama than it does to Western European partners such, such as France and Germany. Now there's now a substantial and growing literature that records the attack upon democracy and the rise of neo-fascism, which I am here summarizing. Some of the texts, in fact, are written by Republican insiders, people who had a hand in everything I have been summarizing, who have now had conversion experiences. By the way, and importantly, when one thinks of certain contemporary Republican office holders as neo-fascists, one does not have to ascribe to them the premise that they hold a coherent fascist ideology or that they know what they are doing. The issue is that these individuals perform fascism regardless of their intentions, motivations, or ideological competence. Before we turn to the meaning of democracy, I want to say a brief word about education. Just as we cannot have peace without peace education, we cannot have democracy without democracy education. Human beings are formed through a great multiplicity of phenomena. We are formed into democratic citizens and justice seeking peaceful human beings or otherwise by that which informs us. The words that we use that speak to this truth are so ubiquitous that we've lost sight of it. We speak of being informed and we speak of information as though somehow all that is meant is cognitive processes whereby we accept and absorb to some degree facts, narratives, concepts, opinions, and data as mental and intellectual activity. Yet, careful attention to the meaning of being informed draws us to the deeper process of human being and becoming of being formed. In the end, what is most important about information is not mere data or cognitive activity. What is truly important is the formation of persons that is produced by the information we receive. In other words, the formation of our minds, but also the formation of our hearts, our souls, and our desires. What if education isn't really first and foremost about what we know, but about what we love. Education is not merely an informational project. It is also a formational project, attending not only to what we know, but to how we live, what we desire, 
what we love and what we will do to embody those desires and loves. Democracy is difficult. We will not be up to the task without democratic formation. Such formation requires a considerable set of skills and virtues to be inculcated and nurtured within children, citizens, culture, and institutions. Democracy does not just happen. It needs to be built and, maintain and maintained and, and protected. And like all demanding building projects, powerful resources of knowledge begotten by education and character and practice are necessary. The word liturgy from the Greek liturgia means public service, literally work for the people. Some of you may recognize this as a theological word, a church word, which means a form of worship that does work for the people. It means the form that we call worship as public service. The idea of work and service is important. The nexus between hearing and learning and receiving and participating on one hand and changing and serving and working and doing, on the other, are compacted into that word. Therefore, liturgy is everywhere. We are being informed, influenced, inspired, again, formed throughout our days, wherever we are. Across the geography of societies like ours, people learn many things and are being shaped in many and often conflicting ways. There is liturgy at the shopping mall, the football game, the public school, the workplace, the theater, in front of the television or computer screen, and of course in religious spaces. All of these places are liturgical spaces. Liturgy is happening. Liturgy is pedagogy. People are being formed there by that. An essential question for us is then, how can we use a multiplicity of spaces and pedagogies to form people into democratic persons and citizens? In many of our societies, liturgies and liturgical spaces, our children and we are being formed to believe in hyper-individualism, in that life is a zero-sum game, that conflict is necessary to get what one needs, that violence is salvific, that white Christian nationalism is deserved under attack and in need of aggressive defense, and that injustice is a necessary cost for freedom and order. Conformity is taught more than courage. Short-term success is taught more than sustainability, and ignorance taught more than imagination. Hubris more than humility, hopelessness more than hope, resentment more than resolution, grievance more than grit or grace, and fear is taught more than love. Democracy education is information around equality and freedom, peace and justice, human dignity and human security, responsibility for others and accountability for oneself. It is education to form persons into full and beautiful humanity where our loves and our desires build a better world for all. In order to interrogate more specifically what education should be in order to form democratic citizens, we need now to turn to a consideration of democracy itself. Marx argued that democracy is the truth of the state. He used the word truth in the German in the sense of meaning fidel fidelity or loyalty. Democracy for Democrats is the litmus test of a healthy society and therefore its state. But there is something inaccurate in speaking of democracy because healthy societies are always democratizing. And of course, democratic backsliding occurs also here and there in even the most democratic societies. So democracy exists in fluidity, in terms of more and less. And Democrats think of the problems of democracy are generally remedied by more democracy. We must not only rebuild institutions, but create a democratic conscience and culture to give birth to and support the institutional changes. Democracy is a political form that takes the moral mandate of equality most seriously. 
persons as equal subjects of dignity and worth, and the concomitant respect due to each is the irreducible core of democratic theory and commitment. To take the moral obligation of equality seriously means that we will build deeply democratic political associations. But democratization is something deeper than institution building. Whitman referred to democracy as open-handedness. Dewey wrote that it is a form of government only in as much as it is first a form of moral and spiritual association. Gandhi said that the spirit of democracy cannot be imposed from without, that it has to come from within, and that it is not simply a mechanical thing to be adjusted by abolition of forms, but rather it requires change of heart. Sheldon Wolin wrote of democracy as a mode of being. Democracy arises, it is not imposed. We do not simply... Democratic state institutions are born from democratic civil society and culture, which are born from democratic citizens. But of course, democratic to raise a child. Yet we also need to know what it takes to raise a village. Following from the commitment to equality, which gives rise to democracy, we build greater authentic freedom for all, which can never mean more freedom for some than for others, Following from that equality, radical democracy calls for institutions, principles, laws, procedures, policy that protect and encourage and enable and employ inclusivity and reciprocity and mutuality and publicity and transparency and accountability. These necessary aspects of democracy flow inextricably from equality in theory and in material form. Michael Walzer wrote that democracy has three basic principles or foundations. He says, in a democratic society, all citizens have equal and robust democratic power. All citizens have equal and robust access to economic power. And all citizens exercise their citizenship in a relationship of moral accountability and responsibility to one another. Walzer is right about the power sharing that is democracy. After all, the word means people power. Democracy is not only structural and systemic, consisting in components and criteria and conditions. It is also dynamic and unsettled and fluid and flowing as democratization implies. Democracy is rhizomatic. It is grass growing through cement. It is inventive and innovative and imaginary and often ad hoc. Democracy is the connective tissue in an ecology of multiple imperatives and values and concerns and identities, impulses, legacies, languages, roles, spaces, and responsibilities. Democracy is moral energy at work producing hope. It is the sweat, laughter, tears, joy, frustration, anger, reward, grit, and grace of the demos taking Kratos in hand and using that power to build a tomorrow which is better than today. It is not passive or lazy, and therefore representative democracy must play a limited role. Rousseau thought of representative democracy as an oxymoron, and there is considerable truth to that view. So when we need to employ representation, as we sometimes do, we should use more democratic means of doing so rather than less. There are a number of ways to do so. One might be, for example, to eliminate the Senate and expand the House, creating more districts and lessening the ratio of citizens to representatives. Who could serve more as proxies for all the people in their districts rather than for the rich, powerful, and connected people who surround them? Perhaps people who reach a certain level of wealth should have to put their money at a certain point of excess into a blind trust in order to be eligible for political office. And certainly, we should use some of the seats for those who would be representatives of other species and the natural world more generally. I think we also, so also should use some of our seats for those who would represent the interests of other countries. Because after all, when the United States sneezes, the world catches a cold. 
There are many imaginative ways to think about representation, and we have done almost none of that work in our country's history, let alone in the second half of the 20th century and the present, when some of that work might have been generated. But if we care about democracy, we are horrified to have found ourselves in this profoundly anti-democratic sink in our country's history. And we will take this moment of crisis to be a moment of opportunity. And we will have to think a lot more carefully than we have done. For example, it does little good to simply lament, lament the loss of democracy without understanding why so many in our country have come to hold it in such low esteem. For many members of the Republican Party in particular, the erosion of democracy is cause for celebration, not lament. It's part of their designs. Young people in the United States across the spectrum of political ideology report record levels of low enthusiasm for democracy. We have cheapened the word and the discourse about it, and so naturally it is seen to have not served us well. We need to rebuild and reinvent the meaning of the concept, recovering its moral substance and its radical character. All human beings belong to communities of memory, and some of us also belong to communities of hope. Memory can be used for powerfully constructive projects, but it can be used for powerfully destructive projects as well. Too often, our memory work, our memorization, our memorialization, our celebrations, and our myth-making is motivated by and promotes fear. Some communities look backwards not to find resources to guide us into the future, but to stoke a sense of loss, to create a lament and grievance and resentment and anger. And this kind of memory work is also a work of forgetting, because memory of this kind is highly selective. The contemporary attack on history, seen, for example, in the attacks on critical race theory that have produced anti-educational legislation in red states, is an example. It reminds me of the old Soviet joke uh, Soviet citizens reminded one another that they knew the reality of the present. It was always clear to them. But it was the reality of the past that was always in doubt. Authoritarian regimes and the parties that support them are always rearranging the meaning of the past to suit the purposes of their present. Memory, fear, grievance, and forgetting are amalgamized into a destructive alchemy. And we are seeing this at work across our country in a number of ways. So those of us who care about democracy must speak to those who do not, and we must speak the language of hope. For all people, all people want to have hope. Our memories must be truthful, however, however difficult that truthfulness may be and serve to help us build futures that carry forward the best of the past. Instead of forgetting, we must engage in reckoning. Desmond Tutu, in opening remarks before the convening of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, we are charged to unearth the truth about our dark past and to lay the ghosts of the past to rest so that they will not return and haunt us. Now that is a credo for all democratic societies. This work of democratization is challenging because it requires courage and humility, as does all work that seeks to align with truth. We must wrestle with the past truthfully, but also with the present. Memory, forgetfulness, and fear, or memory, reckoning, and hope, which community will prevail? The crisis, the crossroads, the challenge could not be more important. Conservative and conventional forces have the easy path because human beings prefer the devils they know over the ones they have not yet met, because we are prone to paths of least resistance, because our collective moral psychology and collective identity impels us to circle the wagons, because we are good at confirmation bias and good at selective memory and the myth-making they produce. 
those committed to democracy are necessarily committed to humility and courage and truth and hope, which is the more difficult path. Naturally, of course, all people believe themselves to be interested in truth and are relatively truth-bound or believe themselves to be so. And I'm not making the simple and lazy claim that those who identify as conservative are just simply less truthful than others. Rather, it is a cultural and structural matter related to the way that coll collective moral psychology is at work in traditions and societies. Like Reinhold Niebuhr, James Baldwin was adept at interrogating this feature of our society. And he wrote, the will of the people in America has always been at the mercy of an ignorance not merely phenomenal, but sacred and sacredly cultivated. And although we cannot interrogate the meaning of truth this morning, for lack of time, we know that we have found ourselves in what is for many on the right something of a post-truth society. That is, not only that lies and deceits abound, but that people tell them unabashedly in public spaces in norm-shattering ways. The people charged, for example, at the Washington Post with tracking Donald Trump's public lies while only in office, counted 30,573 of them. That's a lie told in public by a president 21 times a day for four years. When we try to understand how this happened and how the deceit and hypocrisy and self-contradiction that has become ubiquitous has emerged, I think it adheres to a larger and deeper pathology, and it is this. It is a commonplace for people to observe from time to time, in one case or another, that the ends justify the means. My view of morality is that man means and ends must be congruent, and that one cannot be justified in doing something wrong for the purpose of achieving a more important right. Like Jeff, we, we, we appreciate Kant. I'm not a consequentialist. But of course, this is a complicated matter and sophisticated versions of consequentialism exist for good reasons. Moreover, everyone will, if pushed hard enough in a specific event, do something that they may feel to be immoral for the larger, more important good that seems to make that immorality necessary. But what seems to me to be going on is a mass movement on the right in justifying means that others of us find abhorrent because they have told one another that what is at stake, for example, a country that keeps white hegemony, demands it. As I say, we cannot engage a discussion of truth and truth-seeking here but it is important to note that the meaning of truth and the meaning of democracy are connected in complex and demanding ways. And if we are to have democracy, we will have to have collective commitment to truth-seeking and truth-telling. And this will entail meaningful agreement about how truth is known and adjudicated. That is a steep climb. That's a lot of hard work but it is necessary work. When we think then about how we educate our children and ourselves into the democratization, into democratic action and values and virtues and norms and means and mechanisms and commitments, we have a profound challenge on our hands. And I will say a few things that I think are necessary components of the basic architecture needed. Let us first simply remind ourselves that all important endeavors among human beings undertake that we take, undertake together are possible, possible only in so far as we are taught and we learn. Dewey noted that democracy is educative by definition, writing that democracy has to be born anew every generation and education is its midwife. In order to have democratic structures, we need democratic culture, and in order to have democratic culture, we need people shaped by some habits of the heart as opposed to others, to use de Tocqueville's memorable phrase. Democratic citizens embody democratic virtues. 
Now, I've already mentioned the virtues of equality and truthfulness, humility and courage. Note, by the way, that all aspects of morality require equality and truthfulness and humility and courage. Note also that patience is a form of courage. Tolerance, respect, and compassion, and peacefulness and justice, and the capacity and desire to forgive, gracefulness and hope, these moral virtues are necessary for democracy to grow and thrive. Now, when I appeal for these virtues, I do not have in mind the simplicity of individuals acting with patience or grace with one another, with their neighbors or fellow members at their synagogue or mosque or church, or with other parents at the Saturday morning soccer game. One of the critical mistakes made by most of us in this country, but particularly among those on the conservative and liberal uh, libertarian right, is to habitually define ethics down to the simplest and smallest unit of analysis, the individual. Thus, racism is nothing more than personal bigotry. If persons have wealth and speak uh, with compassion for the poor, they're being hypocritical. If we elect good people to office, all of our politics will be good. And as Mitt Romney said when running for president, Corporations are people because they're constituted by people. When these are the kinds of tropes that circulate with power on the right, and they are damaging because they miss the complex systemic nature of human conduct, morality, and social construction. So, no, when I speak of these virtues, I have in mind not only the way individual persons are formed, but the way they form social networks from economic to political institutions, from tax policy to health care policy to foreign policy. And of course, educational policy. I believe these virtues need to be taught explicitly. And I'm aware, of course, that we inhabit a liberal country and therefore are wisely wary of shoving our own moralities down the throats of others, or even seductively imposing them, for that matter. But I think that the virtues I have just listed have a wide purchase and can be enjoined by people of various faith traditions and those who reject such traditions. And of course, there are specific notions attached to the meaning of compassion or justice or peace that are found in one tradition or one community or another that differ from the others. But I think that we can leave these particular ideas aside in public education and still have substantive education about democratic virtues. Now, I'm not, by the way, reducing my idea of education to public schools. We are informed. We encounter liturgies that form us everywhere, from discussion around the family dinner table to discourse around the national debate. A great multiplicity of sites in civil society and the state are proper spaces to learn from one another about the meaning of democratic virtue. But I do think we need to rebuild our schools in certain ways. I think that all students should have to pass a class in democracy in order to graduate from high school. Mandated in high public high schools, such courses should be recommended for private ones. I think, by the way, that all students should also need to pass a class in sustainability and conflict uh, transformation, and that these two classes would constitute an important pedagogical relationship. If all students in the United States took at least one class about the meaning of democracy, well, college and university students being educated to become teachers would have to have their education changed as well. Thus, we would hire democratic theorists in education departments and colleges of education. The executive branch of the national government should have a new cabinet member, a secretary of democracy. This person would work closely with the secretaries of labor and of health and human services, and perhaps others, on issues of equality, and work closely with the secretary of education on matters of pedagogy. Of course, a minimal set of criteria and standards would be mandated, as with other disciplines and subjects. And religious communities are prime locations for democracy education, 
as the moral values that generate and support democracy are generally taught by these faith traditions. I mean, why not connect all the dots and teach children and adults to, you know, for example, do unto others as they would have others do unto them as a matter of citizenship and politics. But we need to transform many sites of human activity into laboratories of democracy. Schools, where students would have more democratic power, corporate shareholders, and certainly the workplace, which of course is a primary and perennial objective of socialism, immediately come to mind. But of course, the sphere of activity that cries out most urgently for democracy is political association. And there are many critically important changes that must be made in how we do politics in this country if we want to be a democracy. The most important thing I have to say is this. There is an extrinsic, intrinsic relationship between democracy and imagination and education and imagination. And our hope for beautifully flowering, fecund democracy for a strong and resilient democracy that is up to the grave challenges of our time is only as possible as our imaginative powers allow. The logic and moral energy of democracy is inventive. We live in the gray choking despair of so many disimagination machines, to use the language of Henry Giroux. We must counter and defeat the disimagination which controls so much of our culture and our institutions, our economics, our politics, our religion, and our education. And when I speak of imagination, my conception is at its heart the moral imagination. Democracy names the process of acting on the premise that as persons we can change and that we can therefore have a theory of change, and we can therefore act for change together and produce a better tomorrow. Aldous Huxley said, all that we are and do depends in the last analysis upon what we believe the nature of things to be. Can we change or not? And David Graeber said that since human beings create and recreate the world every day, there is no inherent reason why they should not be able to create one we actually like. This is the premise and promise that democracy seeks to realize. But it's not enough to proclaim the need for imagination. What we have to do is make a profound commitment to pedagogies of imagination. And I suspect that we'll have to learn much more about swarm intelligence, emergence theory, theories of resilience, systems theory, and indigenous knowledge to give greater depth and sophistication to our understanding of what imagination is and how it works and how to teach it. And I suspect that the best way to learn imagination will always be, as it is now, to see it at work in others, especially those we admire. After all, the most imaginative things human beings do, from the frontiers of science to the frontiers of music, come from intuitions born and built within us because of our immersion, our baptism, in the imagination of others. I hope to see democratic theory grow into synthesis with theories of imaginative pedagogy and practice. I hope to see departments and colleges of education filled with the science and art of imaginative pedagogy and practice. I hope to see poets and physicists and earth scientists and coders and linguists, theologians and philosophers and sociologists and anthropologists and activists and philanthropists and economics, ec economists and environmentalists and politicians and indigenous leaders sitting around tables together, walking together, cooking together, sailing together and talking together, imagining with one another how to produce democratic forms, flows and force fields to meet the needs and dangers 
that assault us daily. We need to produce more knowledge and more democracy to overcome the politics of cynicism, violence, dispossession, disposability, alienation, and abandonment that have become our daily norm. We need pedagogies and liturgies of hope to displace the many pedagogies and liturgies of fear, convention, and cowardliness that surround us. The philosopher Jonathan Lear engages in a project he calls philosophical anthropology in his brilliant book, Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation. He makes a careful interrogation of the life and death of the last great chief of the Crow Nation, Plenty Coops. The strong leader told his story to a Frank B. Linderman who had come to Montana in 1885 as a teenager. And it's clear that Linderman and Plenty Coops had become friends. And at the end of the book, Plenty Coops is recorded as saying, I'm glad I've told you these things, sighing talker. You have felt my heart, and I have felt yours. And I know you would tell only what I have said, that your writing will be straight like your tongue. And I will sign your paper with my thumb, so that your people and mine will know I told you the things you have written down. In Linderman's note at the end of his book, he writes that he was unable to get Plenty Coops to talk about anything that had happened after the Crow were defeated and confined to a reservation. It reads, Plenty Coops refused to speak of his life after the passing of the buffalo so that his story seems to have been broken off, leaving many years unaccounted for. I have not told you half of what happened when I was young, he said when urged to go on. I can think back and tell you so much more of war and horse stealing, but when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they would not lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. There was little singing anywhere. Besides, he added sorrowfully, the buffalo went away. The powerful and tragic exclamation here is that after defeat, loss of the buffalo and containment on a reservation, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they could not pick them up. After this, nothing happened. We don't know exactly what Plenty Coops meant, but he seems to be speaking of such a traumatic shift in life, the life of his people, that it was as if time stood still, color turned colorless and music stopped, at least most of the singing. And life was perhaps barely recognizable. Heartbreak came upon a nation. A people knew a collective melancholy or even psychological depression. The loss of a way of life brought this about hearts on the ground. Lear wrote this book as a means to grapple with the question, how can we face the possibility that one's culture is on the precipice of collapse? Now, I mention Lear's book for two reasons. The first is that we too may be living on a precipice of losing our culture. Our lives, as we have known them, may soon be over. What would a complete collapse of democracy look like here? Sinclair Lewis is often noted as saying, when fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in a flag and carrying a cross. In 1936, James Waterman Wise Jr. wrote in the Christian Century that if fascism comes to the United States, it will be wrapped in the American flag and heralded as a plea for liberty and preservation of the Constitution. We don't know what the future holds, but those of us committed to democracy are quite interested 
in avoiding a full-blown fascism. The second reason I spoke of Manny Coops and his claim that the hearts of his people were on the ground is because it turns out he provided them with courageous leadership through visionary hope and found ways to make life meaningful, meaningful again for his people. Now listen, it is tragic to think that what is good about the world is exhausted by our current understanding of it. That's a mistake and a disease made by many people who call themselves conservative, but not them alone. And Plenty Coops saw a way to lead his people out of that dark tragedy and hope. And he led the crow into a new life and culture which continued in ways that were possible with the past, but also adapted to new realities. And this adaptation was not an expression of despair, as it would have been for Sitting Bull, but rather it was the only way to avoid despair. Lear summarizes the practice of radical hope that Plenty Coops offered by saying that the great chief offered the crow a traditional way of going forward. Now here we are. We are called, everyone in this room, by circumstances in history, even perhaps by providence, to deploy courageous and hopeful imagination in the service of building a democratic future. And we will need to use much of our best traditions, but bring forth new conceptions and dynamics and structures as well to go forward. But I do not want to end on hope alone. I also want to invoke a word that some of you will find out of place in an academic address. It is the word love. I've kept silent about love until now so as not to alienate in the audience, anyone in the audience too soon. <laughs> and I hope I don't alienate you now. <laughs> and by love, I do not mean anything sentimental or merely emotional by you know, use of the word love. I don't mean that. When Cornell West announces that love is what justice looks like in public, he is only repeating a conventional idea from the New Testament that has long been known by many. In fact, I'm reminded of a lyric from the song Lovers in a Dangerous Time by Bruce Coburn, who I'm sure Pierre knows well. <laughs> he sings, nothing worth having comes without some kind of fight. You gotta kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight when we're lovers in a dangerous time. My primary tradition proclaims that we should always seek to speak and do the truth in love. It's, common, it's a common simplification of this command that it is somewhat easier to be either truthful or loving, but hard to do both at the same time. And there's something accurate about that, perhaps from one case to another. But the New Testament's teaching about truth and love points us to deeper waters. In the end, we actually just cannot be truthful without love. And we cannot love without commitment to truth. The New Testament also tells us that love casts out or defeats fear. And as a strategic matter, to defeat all the fear that mobilizes so many of our fellow citizens, we must operate with love. In the end, truth and love and beauty, they're the same thing. Democracy names the political form that follows from our commitment to love and truth. James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it's faced. Commitment to love and truth, to equality and democracy, to virtue and sustainable and hopeful futures require that we face up to where we are and what is going on around us. 
Grand, she said that the old world is dying and the new cannot be born in this interregnum. A great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Now is the time of monsters. But of course, we're in an interregnum. We are in between what once was and what we will have. And our challenge is, will it be democracy or something worse? It's time to face down the monsters. Donald Trump may or may not be held accountable for his misdeeds and almost certain crimes. And if he is not held accountable, what will that cowardice be? Will it be the last act of a putatively democratic society? Elections are near. Will we vote Democrats into office? And I mean Democrat with a small d, not a capital D. Will we defeat authoritarian candidates and forces or not? In plain view, out in the open, shamelessly, political office holders and others from Trump on down have been stealing democracy from us and building neo-fascism in its place. What will we do? Well, I end with William James and then again, a little Baldwin. James wrote, democracy is a kind of religion and we are all bound not to admit its failure. Faiths and utopias are the noblest exercise of human reason and no one with a spark of reason will sit down fatalistically before the croaker's picture. The best of us are filled with the contrary vision of a democracy stumbling through every error till institutions glow with justice and its customs shine with beauty. And Baldwin, the sea rises, the lights fall, lovers cling to each other and children cling to us. The moment we cease to hold each other, the moment we break faith with one another, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. Thank you. Michael, thank, thank you so much for those wonderful comments. I agree with everything that you've said. And I love your, your thoughts about the pedagogy of, of hope, the liturgy of hope, and then your la later invitation to love. And I'm curious, there's one word that you didn't mention, and I want to get your thoughts on it, and that, that's forgiveness. I mean, Hannah Rent says that without forgiveness, we can't move forward, we can't escape the past. So what role would forgiveness play in this renewal of American democracy? I mean, can we, can we forgive Donald Trump? Can we forgive the neo-fascists, I mean, how would forgiveness play out in your vision of this, of our democracy? Well, thanks, Jeff, that's an excellent question. And um, I could have said a lot about forgiveness to be sure, and I encourage you all to read Arendt on forgiveness and political hope. Uh, it's a very much a, some of her most important, important work. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I know that one democratic virtue is the ability and, and willingness to forgive, and then I said no more about it. And it is important, but uh, I would, uh, you know, I only have so much time and there's only so much one can do. And, and um, when, I've t when I deal with forgiveness, and you know, I've, I've written about and uh, spoke about it before, I, I try to give it some real time. Uh, because uh, I think it's really important, but at the same time, it's a, it's a very damaging mistake to, to make people feel like they have to forgive. And, uh, you know, people are not, are not always able or at a place where they can forgive. And to, to, lay, to lay it on them like if they were a better person, they'd forgive it. This is dangerous and destructive 
It's, it's not only uh, psychologically harmful, it's morally harmful. So I think forgiveness is actually very complicated, and I think of it fundamentally as a practice. The way that you do something again and again and again and again to remind yourself who you are, what, you, what your commitments are, and what you're trying to be in this life. You keep practicing it, right? Religious communities have various kinds of practices of that kind, like the Eucharist, for example. Um, and, uh, but it's not unlike uh, learning a, an athletic skill or a musical skill. You know, you practice <laughs> to be what you want to be. And I think forgiveness is many things, but that's at the heart of what I think it is. And so, you do, so we do need to become people who can forgive when, when uh, the virtues are cultivated and the circumstances of life are cultivated such that that makes sense, because it can be very powerful. But it's not just a sentiment, it's not just a claim, it's not just saying to somebody, I forgive you. It's very, very, very hard work. And uh, one last thing, uh, I do think uh, forgiveness is necessary and powerful, but it's not the same thing as not holding people accountable. Th those aren't the same thing. So I think you legitimately and deeply need to forgive people and be forgiven by others for a host of things which entails accepting responsibility and doing what it's necessary to do. And so, for example, the role that forgiveness plays in restorative justice, you know, we hold people account. Um, there's a process they need to engage to make restoration. And uh, that's all important parts of it. So I'd like to say more, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Great question. I was just curious if you um, see any potential dangers to unchecked democracy. I see tremendous danger to bad forms of democracy. But I do not see danger to authentic, deep, and radical democracy. In that case, I think, as I said earlier, uh, the problems that we come to are best solved by more democracy, not less. Uh, in the world, when we have said to others or ourselves, that's too much democracy, uh, the people have run wild, the mob has taken control, people are stupid, and now they're doing stupid things because they get more votes than the people who are less stupid. When things like that happen, and of course they happen a lot, I actually don't think what's going on is properly called democracy. So uh, I think that democracy is a extraordinarily uh, a bastardized term, very much um, uh, uh, misused, and um, and therefore we engage in many kinds of bad politics that we call democracy, and uh, and therefore we we think we can have too much. <laughs> Uh, I don't dismiss your question. I mean, for example, um, we have to take the arguments against democracy seriously. You know, I call it the look around test. You know, go to the mall or the football game or whatever and look around. You want these people in control? You know, people aren't all that bright. And, you know, are we going to trust them? You know, that's a real problem, as has been known since at least, you know, Plato. But but uh, I think if we do democracy well, we can build our way out of that. And and uh, the power of the people, uh, well knitted together to determine their collective future, for all of its dangers, is far less dangerous than other forms. So that's my short answer. Um. How do you justify the tyranny of the 51% over the minority 49% in being um, in like 
reference to the justifi or in reference to the obligation of equality. It, it seems like the 49% wouldn't be getting their share of the equality. Yeah, democracy is not majoritarianism. Anytime, anytime we go around patting ourselves on the back because 51 out of 100 people get their way, we're, we're being naive and uh, dangerous. 51% of people voting on something that 49% of the people vote against is a recipe for danger, disappointment, frustration, anger, apathy, and violence. It's uh, 51 to 49 votes aren't to be celebrated. So I, uh, my theory of democracy is uh, not a theory of majoritarianism. And I worry about bare majorities getting their way at the expense of minorities that have almost as much power. So that's a problem to be solved, in my view. And uh, there, there's a lot of work to do that in a lot of different ways that we probably don't have time to talk about right now, but you're welcome to come see me afterwards and I can tell you a little bit more, point you to some books and so on. Thanks for that very good question. Uh, so Michael, there's been discussion on campus of late uh, about uh, retooling the general education program here at UVU. And I'm interested in your thoughts on how educating for democracy, right, in your vision might, might fit within a uh, general education program at a state university like ours. Wow, what a very practical good question. <laughs> Well, it won't surprise you when you hear me say, I think it would be a great fit, you know. Uh, first of all, of course, here at UVU, it, the wonderful institution of ethics and values exists where all students have to take uh, a course which introduces them to moral theory and, and uh, ethical problem solving and, and, and all, the, all the sorts of things you do in that, in that uh, course, in that cl those classes. And so uh, that's, that's a good start and a good handmaid and a good partner to some pedagogy that we could you could institute here, I presume. I said we as if I was still here. <laughs> uh, uh, around, around democratic power and power sharing and democracy and what that is because it's so closely aligned to, to moral theory and as I, I try to make clear and we already have that step well taken. Um, also, we live in a culture where I think there's a great uh, bit of, um, of valuing of, of ordinary people's powers and uh, views. And, uh, and uh, the, so I think there's like some cultural, uh, 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 there's some architecture here culturally that that, that you know in the in the uh, LDS faith and uh, elsewhere that I think we could uh, build on you could build on sorry and uh, so I, I think that there could be a way in general general education to to help students learn what it would be and become excited about being democratic citizens exercising that power with a kind of uh, moral vitality and, and vision for a better, what would a better life look like for all of us, not just for some of us? And I think there could be a set of controlling questions like that about that the pedagogy could be built around. So I'll just say that for the moment. Thanks, Michael, for your really uh, insightful urgent and um, absolutely relevant uh, take on education for democracy. Um, in, and I'm gonna kind of piggyback off of Brian's question. So in one of the required readings, they addressed um, kind of this transformation that's taken place in what we perceive to be education, where initially education was 
published like m like made a public feature of American society for the purpose of civics and citizenship, and has now shifted to be more career centric, um, and maybe economically focused. So I'm wondering how we can incorporate pedagogies of imagination and education for democracy into um, into STEM education, since that's kind of where the focus on education and like um, is has been moving. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, yeah, I think what we one of the things we would have to do is is remind ourselves that there there's a reason to to put first things first, or you know, as Augustine put it, for example, put our loves in order. I mean, you know, it's good to have training to become a good accountant or a scientist or educator or or whatever you know to get a job and become a taxpayer and contribute to society. I mean, that's a value, of course. But in the end, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, w w is it more important that a person is, say, an excellent accountant or an excellent human being? You know, an excellent biologist or an excellent human being? You know, what, what's really most important? And so even within the sciences, even within uh, the drive, which is overbearing and out of all proportion uh, that makes any sense in my mind, to use college education simply to prepare people, you know, for the uh, for a job. Uh, for for all of that, which is overbearing, as I said, uh, it still is most important for most people if they stop and think about it you know there are things more important than that and and a a university is a wonderful place for people to meet difference and meet diversity and meet challenge and uh not just have their uh the views they came with affirmed and reified but, you know, the journey, which is a college or university education, is a journey of, as I said in my paper, not only gaining information, but even more importantly, being formed. As I put it, you know, maybe education is more ultimately not about information, but about love, you know, what, what we love. And that's not out of place or in some kind of uh, conflict with STEM education. It's at the heart of STEM education because it's at the heart of all education. And uh, so I think that that can be taught and I think that can be nurtured and inculcated and done so in exciting ways. But, you know, there, there's no professor in this room who ever had any of that kind of education as a part of his or her own education. No one ever said, oh, you're going to go be a professor. Well, here's another set of, you know, concepts and understandings and theories you have to have. You know, democratic virtue, <laughs> democratic theory, what love looks like, you know. So there's a lot of hard work to do. But I don't see it as, I don't see it, uh, finally I'll say, more shortly, as succinctly, I don't see these things in conflict. That's what the main thing, I see them as integrated into each other if they're understood well. Thanks. Sadly, we've reached the end of our time. Uh, before we publicly thank Michael for his presentation, just a couple of reminders. If you're interested in the, the rest of the week's schedule, you can scan the QR codes on the walls. Uh, that'll take you to the web page where we have the complete schedule. And also, if you want to do a brief uh, survey, there are QR codes on the backs of these chairs. We'd like to know uh, what you think of our sessions and, and generally how we're doing. So with that said, please join me in thanking Michael Mensch.